watch Captain Karen's Coming to you live and direct from a country not invented by Kenneth Branagh in front of a tree, it is Jury Friday. Proud to be an American on this, the first Olympic Saturday. Man, those opening ceremonies are ridiculous. They were absolutely... (laughs) They were a ridiculous spectacle. And I guess it's kind of the point, right? They're supposed to be a ridiculous spectacle. That's why they put them on. It's a, it's, it's kind of a very silly event. It really is a combination between, you know, very silly and very, very serious. Because on, on one hand, it is silly in that it's, it's a bunch of people competing in sporting events. You know, how serious of, can anybody take sporting events? And, and obviously, people do take them seriously, but they take them seriously because they are inherently not serious. We, we want a place where we can kind of focus our attention on things, comprehend things on a very simple level, and enjoy them. And I love sports. But ultimately, it's not war. It's not life or death. It's a lot of dedication and hard work expunged over a three-week span every few years. Uh, So... The opening ceremonies, I guess, I mean, on some level, have to be a, a reflection of the home country, and b, it's something that's memorable, it's something that, that that commemorates such a unique experience. That being said, what the fuck? Seriously, what the fuck? Like the Chinese one, obviously, Beijing, uh, Beijing, you know, obviously, kind of set the bar in the parlance of Heath Ledger in Grease Paint. You changed things. It was amazing. They were they had a huge gigantic spectacle, and it made it was kind of crazy. In a sort of, I don't even know what what the artistic term would be. I mean, a a, a vaguely incomprehensible level. Like it was just crazy visuals over and over and over again. Crazy visuals, crazy visuals, crazy visuals. The London Olympics decided to tell a story, and I don't know exactly what the story was, aside from things have happened in Britain. Basically, that was what it was. Hey, everybody, things have happened in Britain. Also, James Bond. Also, J.K. Rowling and a 70-foot Voldemort, and yet, no Harry Potter. They have a 70-foot fucking Voldemort, and that you can't fuck. What the fuck is Daniel Radcliffe doing? Where is Daniel Radcliffe? Like, right now. Seriously, somebody called Daniel. Daniel, get on the phone, Daniel. Where are you at? This is a 70-foot fucking Voldemort. Britain's gotten the, this is the first time in fucking 70 years they got the, the Olympics. You can't bring old fucking Danny Radcliffe out there with a wand to say expecto Patronus one last motherfucking time? For real? Danny, pick up the phone, Danny. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get why Doctor Who wasn't there. As soon as I started seeing all the fucking the British you know, fucking, it was it was like remote control. That movie remote control where the the parents had the remote control and Satan was Satan the cable guy a remote control or was it Stay Tuned? I think it was called Stay Tuned. The one with the um the 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 remote control and the parents just kept going through all the. Uh, all the different channels. Um, so anyway, it was like that. Except all the fucking characters from British pop culture decided to pour their way into the Olympic ceremonies. And all we get is the fucking TARDIS sound. Number one, who plays the fucking TARDIS sound and doesn't produce a goddamn TARDIS? How fucking hard is that? For real. They had the entire Industrial Revolution pop up in the middle of this goddamn stadium that they probably built on the taxpayer's dime. You know? And then the blade thing, they don't have the TARDIS. Should have had the entire fucking thing come out of the TARDIS. Should have been nothing. Big, concrete. And then all of a sudden, Kenneth Branagh walks out and stay tuned. Thank you. Meeks, Bill Meeks, Mixed Media. That was the name of that movie that I was trying to remember. Uh, and then Kenneth Branagh comes out and says, I declare this England, as he's smoking a cigar that's not lit. I don't know. I mean, 
I guess they were fine. I mean, I, I just I was I was puzzled by why they wanted to do things with such a crazy narrative, and, and then, then also the things that they wanted to highlight were weird, like house parties. Really, we're gonna take fifteen minutes out of the fucking Olympic ceremonies. The world is watching, and we're gonna do fifteen minutes so we can play a tape of two fucking assholes dancing in an attic. That's what we're doing. That's how we've decided to use this time. We've decided to use this time by having Two kids meet in the middle of a dance number and then go to an attic and, and dance themselves. Neshkom says, music is one of England's biggest cultural contributions. Sure. I'm not saying that music was not a gigantic part of, of England's uh, cultural contributions, but you want to know what? How would you have just a crazy, you know, concert, super medley? I, now I'm getting criticized, and I think it's by British people that I watched the NBC broadcast, and, and, and I had a bad time. And I will go even further that my criticism is unfair, because it is in fact unfair, because I didn't even listen to the audio. I watched it in a bar on mute and just was flabbergasted by the visuals. So I didn't even hear the music. All I saw was like, is that fucking James Bond? What's J.K. Rowling doing out over there? Hey, Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet. I did like that. I did like that uh, they rolled out Tim Berners-Lee <laughs> for like five seconds so we can tap two things on a keyboard and then just like, hey, everybody, Tim Berners-Lee, look at me. <laughs> I invented the fucking internet. Anyway, I'm going to go fuck off. Why am I in the middle of a stadium? Why couldn't I have done that on tape delay? We had the two fucking idiots dancing in the fucking attic on tape delay. We had James Bond uh, on, on, on tape, and yet we can't have... T Tim Berners-Lee has to go out in the middle of, of the stadium, in the middle of... Uh... By the way, could Harry and, and Kate have looked more bored? Th that entire, the younger wing of the royal family could not have looked more bored if it was nothing but Rowan Atkinson, not Mr. Bean, searching in his pockets for his keys for three hours. That's how bored they looked. It was just Rowan Atkinson as a guy, not a character, not trying to do it in a funny way. Just... Uh, did I leave it in the kitchen? Did I leave it in the den? Hmm. Rinse and repeat for three hours. That's how bored they look. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So everybody's getting up my butt about, like, how they filtered out content. I know that they filtered out the 7-7 seven, seven tribute. And is was that really dumb? Because they replaced it with a fucking interview with Brian Seacrest and Michael Phelps? Yeah, no, that's stupid. That's really dumb. Like, I, I, I'm not denying that and should i've seen that in a bar with no sound therefore invalidating any and all of my criticism by the way i'm not i'm not in any way saying that i can i can be a valid critic of this i can i can only state my own opinion but if i had seen that it would look like a big crazy dance number or a big moving dance number you know i will say this i did get back to my house uh during the crazy bike um, butterfly, were they bike butterflies or bike angels? Bike angel, bike angel, play into the Arctic monkeys. Um, I thought that was okay. Uh, I don't, I don't quite know why the Arctic monkeys were playing a come together cover. Um, and not Paul McCartney? Like, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, yeah. But I like that. I thought they did a great job. I don't know why they did it, but I thought that the Arctic Monkeys did a fantastic job covering Come Together. I would like, I, I like the Arctic Monkeys. And apparently so does Bob Costas, which kind of made me reevaluate re how much I like the Arctic Monkeys. Anyway, so that was my thoughts about the opening ceremonies. I, I think it's good. I, I think the Olympics are really, really fun. 
Um, I like yelling at my television a lot. This gives me a very good reason to not only yell at my television, but also to draw lines on uh, race and borders in a socially acceptable manner. I can yell about other people's nationalities in a derogatory way. And um, I'm happy about that. Always happy. Always happy to have an excuse to yell about, like, you know, you can't run fast because you're blank country, you know. Uh, so there we go. That is my Olympic summation. Um, other than that, I, I don't know. I, I don't even know really what I'll watch in the Olympics. Definitely the basketball. I love uh, you know, the basketball has always been good over the last couple of Olympics. Now that the U S actually tries and the rest of the world is really good because they're filled with NBA players, not to the extent of the United States, but, but on a similar level. Uh, and, well, you know, Michael Phelps seems like a massive douche, but, uh, I think it'd be cool to watch him try to win things. Usain Bolt, he's like an insane runner. I mean, really, I don't know. I don't know. I just like uh, yelling at my TV. I think that's it's really where it begins and ends. Okay, coming up on Jury Friday, we will talk about a whole gang of things. And you want to know? I don't know what to start with. I don't know what to start with. I mean, we started with the Olympics just because people were talking about it. And Kenneth, what the fuck was with Kenneth Branagh? Like, what was he even? Was he Mister England? And by the way, if he's Mister England, and by, and, and also. Don't fucking get me started on the fact that he's rolling around with this crazy posse of stovetop hat people, and there's, like, the one black guy. Like, like they had to put in the one black guy so that it wouldn't just, you know, be like, oh, well, of course, it's a whole bunch of old white men invented England. Which, by the way, they did. Like, that's what happened. And then they have the one black guy, and then they had, like, their crazy, like, Macarena dance. Um, so he was Zambard Kingdom Brunel so yes he was Mr. England I don't know oh oh, by the way this is one thing one last Olympic thought my favorite story every Olympics and it happens every Olympics somebody writes about it they will write about it this time they've already been writing about it is this phenomenon during the Olympics you have a lot of people who have dedicated their lives to physical perfection in their sport. Whether or not they win, they have dedicated that. Now, there are certain prices to this dedication. Many times, it is a social life. You don't go out with your friends. You don't maintain relationships the same way. You always are, have a very selfish pursuit of your goal. So you go to the Olympics, you have this massive hurdle, or many hurdles, in the case of the track and field athletes, in front of you, and you complete them. Whether or not you win, you are done with them. The entirety of a portion of your life uh, is done. And now, with this gigantic weight off your shoulders, you find yourself in a series of dorm rooms with nothing but other people who are extremely physically fit, most likely single, and have reason to celebrate because they've just had a massive weight lifted off their shoulders. Many of you have already picked up on this because it is also your favorite story during the Olympics, which is the fact that the Olympic Village is just a sweaty, hot nest of fuck noises. Um, it's always very funny to me, and I always really, really like the stories from people from, like, table tennis and like, uh, <laughs> like the distance shooting. <laughs> it's like regular, like dudes who aren't, you know, like in crazy shape that just have like rippled muscles and like super tone. Like just like a dude who knows how to shoot a gun really well, and like he winds up getting banged by like three gigantic uh, volleyball players from Senegal. That's awesome. That is. Uh, really, really fun to me. I always like hearing about that because that's the kind of guy I am. Yeah, I'm going to talk about this story. And, and I, it's gotten a lot of play, but let me read for you a story by a man named Joe Peacock. 
Joe Peacock writes for CNN and a blog called Geek Out. I read from his story this week. There is a growing chorus of frustration in the geek community with, and there's no other way to put this, pretty girls pretending to be geeks for attention. San Diego Comic-Con is the largest vehicle, but it's hardly the only convention populated with, quote, hot chicks, unquote, wearing skimpy outfits simply to get a bunch of gawking geeks head to turn, just to satisfy their hollow egos. Now, before every single woman reading this explodes, let me disambiguate a bit. I also do not believe that every girl who attends conventions and likes Doctor Who is pretending to be a geek. Okay. Now, let me get a few things out on Front Street. Forever, for as long as there has been geek culture, and let's let's define geek culture. Let's not mince words here. Let's define geek culture in terms of conventions. People who leave their house and go to conventions. It is predominantly male dominated. That's just a fact. Like Agnes, Agatha, Jermaine, and Jack. Um and we're talking about geek culture. So let's say Comic Con, Dragon Con, that kind of stuff. Dragon Gun started out as a Dungeons and Dragons convention. Not a lot of chicks roll 20-sided dice or no to a convention like that. Okay? Uh, not to say that they don't exist. I'm saying that the ratio. Okay? We are now in a very beautiful time for people who care about things that I would say I care about, and I would go ahead and venture to guess people who are listening to me care about. Comic books, science fiction, fantasy, books, TV shows, movies. Okay? Let's go ahead and move on. They are very popular. They make a lot of money. People, the body politic of America seems to be more in line with our way of thinking. Peacock's article is retarded. Absolutely retarded. Only geeks would find a reason to bitch about people coming to cater to their whims. Okay? Let me... Let's say they are absolutely fucking hollow, right? Let's say that they don't know shit. There is a buy-in to putting on a costume and coming out. And to me, that buy-in is okay to be there. No one's saying that you have to be their best friend. No one's saying that you have to acknowledge them beyond looking at them. But if they want to be part of the party, even on that small level, even if they just want to get looked at as a slutty slave Leia... That's fine. Who cares? Who is being hurt? Where are the victims? Okay? Maybe they are confused. Where are... I, I, just, I, I have a hard time. I'll continue reading from, from Peacock's article. There are a lot of geeks who are female. Some of these female geeks are pretty girls. I find it fantastic that women are finally able to enjoy a culture that has predominantly been male-oriented and male-driven. The presence of female geeks means that the fiction we're reading is broadening and, frankly, getting better in quality. All right. Let's get back to the, what, his, what his point is. Ah. They decide to put on a quote-unquote hot costume, parade around a group of boys notorious for being outcasts that don't get attention from girls and feel like a celebrity. There are six in the real world, but they put on a Batman shirt and head to a local fandom convention du jour... They instantly become a nine. They're poachers. They're a pox on our culture. As a guy, I find it repugnant that due to my interest in comic books, sci-fi, fantasy, and role-playing games, video games, and toys, I'm supposed to feel honored that a pretty girl is in my presence. It's insulting. I just have a hard time connecting that logic. I have a very hard time Seeing that, uh, that he's insulted by what? 
But the fact that a girl wants to come in and dress up as something you recognize, really? That's what, that, I mean, to me, this is only a point if you assume that you are obligated to react to them. That there is an obligation, culturally or no, spoken or unspoken, that we have to react to the girls dressed in sexy costumes. Many times there is. People want to take pictures. People want to get next to somebody, take a picture, put it up on their Facebook. Right? But there's, there's no obligation. A girl can walk around dressed like Slutty Yoda and not know a fucking Dalek from a Tribble and no one can pay attention to her. Like, I, I just, I don't, I, I, I don't see why there is uh, an insult there. And really, here's why, here's why this article bothers me, okay? I think it's a chilling effect to new people who want to become interested in this community. To me, the bigger the community is, the better. I, I like a big tent. I like people who are just kind of getting into stuff. I like people who are super into it and who know more than anybody really should. You know? Um, and I'm fine with anybody who wants to buy in enough to show up. Like, I'm... I'm I'm cool with that. I, I just, I, I guess, I think that if we're drawing lines, if we're saying you're not geek enough, you need to be more geek to talk to us, then we are drawing the same lines that geek culture has kind of rebelled against forever. Now, this is not to say the personal preference. Tensor guy says, I like my geek girl smart and savvy. Me too. I'm not saying that my personal preference is girls who do not know shit about sci-fi, yet show up in sci-fi conventions and get dressed in slutty costumes. I am just saying that I am fine with their existence and I don't find it insulting. Lorelei B says, why go to something if you have no interest in it other than showing off your bits? Well, here's what I would say to that. If you are there, then that to me demonstrates at least a bare minimum of interest enough to be there. I mean, like, getting there, the act, the act of getting there, the act of getting the costume is enough for me. Because at least part of the, the reason why people go to these shows many times is costuming, is cosplaying. Dragon Con is a huge costuming opportunity and environment. People like to dress up in costumes. They like to show off their costumes to other people. They like to get dressed as things for authenticity. If that is your only interest, if you love the costume of Psylocke and think that you have the body type to fit Psylocke and would like to go where other people would appreciate how much you can look like Psylocke, despite the fact that you haven't fucking picked up an X-Men comic, that's fine. That's fine with me. That, to me, is a level of geekiness and a level of obsession that I can appreciate and latch onto. I might not personally have a whole lot to talk to you about, but I like that you're allowed to come to a place where you can be just a little bit more happy. And I guess that's it. I, I, just, I don't like drawing lines on happiness. You know, I, I don't like... Uh, I don't like saying that you can't be here. I think saying you can't be here or this kind of person can't be here is exactly the opposite of what the I love about geek culture. Geek culture is about embracing. It's about saying, dig what you want. Talk about what you want. Find other people who want to talk about that with you. And just because you don't agree with that if that ain't your interest, I don't think we should be drawing lines. And I think this article draws lines. So I'm not a fan of it. And believe you me, this, is, I'm, this isn't a new opinion. I think people have ripped this article for the past week. So uh, it's not, you know, like I'm taking a big, huge, dangerous stance to, to shit on this article. But I do think that, you know, with Dragon Con coming up, God bless him. Slutty Tauntauns, Slutty Yodas, Slutty Daleks. 
slutty tribbles, slutty ATAT walkers, <laughs> slutty. <laughs> What else? What else do we have? Come on, help me out. What are other slutty costumes that you would like to see? Um, I'm sure we'll get there. Slutty huts, slutty panthers, <laughs> slutty Vader. Um, slutty Jawas, slutty Wampas. I'll go all day. All fucking day. Misa slutty? Misa no good. <laughs> slutty Adama? Yes. Yes. Slutty Adama. So say we all. I want to see a fucking slutty Adama. That's what I want to see. <laughs> slutty Richard Ensign. Slutty male Starbuck. Slutty droids. <laughs> uh, so there we go. I want to see them all. I loved, uh, I went to Star Wars Celebration, and I'm so fucking pissed off. I don't get to go to Star Wars Celebration in like a week. Um, but I loved all the slutty Star Wars costumes. I always love all the slutty Star Wars costumes at, uh, or slutty costumes at Dragon Con. I think it's great. If you want to go out there and dress like things I recognize, and I can point and go, oh my god, that's a fucking slutty Atama. Like, it makes me happy, and if it makes them happy that it makes me happy, then that's great. I don't find it insulting. I guess there is just that. All right. What else were we going to talk about? Okay. We can talk about politics. Um, although, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead. And we have a bunch of people here today. Let's... Um, Let's talk about, uh, or let, let's let's take a straw poll. Somebody set up a straw poll for me, and I want to see where you guys are at on this. Um, I, I want to see whether or not you find fake geek girls insulting or not. That is the point that Mr. Peacock is making. I want to know whether or not I'm in I'm in the minority. I might be crazy, um, but I'm just I'm curious. I'm very very curious. Um, so here we go. We have a, a straw poll up. Let's take a look at it right now. Fake geek girls insulting or not. So, uh, all right, one last thing. Uh, I think the issue maybe is that a number of them are paid by vendors, booth babes. I mean, then they're salespeople. Like, we can't recognize that there are salespeople. People are there to sell you things. Some of them hire girls to be window dressing, to get you near their booth so they can sell you things. Like, that to me, I feel like, yeah, why is that an issue? A slutty Slovene, uh, uh, Slovene from Doctor Who with slutty farts. Mm. Um, I mean, because that's the thing. Like, if, if, if we have uh, slutty Oswald Cobblepot, there we go. Um... I guess I, I have I, I can't I don't know where you're where where we're going if it's about booth babes like they're paid there's nothing disingenuous they're there for one reason and that reason is because they're getting paid okay simple slutty Patton Oswald there we go slutty Hal slutty Leo Laporte slutty Wharf these are all great this is going to be amazing. Um, all right, uh, real quick, before I get into, uh, the politics stuff, let me talk about, um, uh, what's happened over the last couple of weeks. So I've been going around the country as with, uh, as part of my gig at the go game. I'm now living in Oakland because I'm working or living in Oakland, working in San Francisco, uh, because I work at a company called the go game. We put on games all over the country. I fly to many places in the country to uh to put on the games so i found myself recently in kansas city and seattle and in both places i've been able to run into people who follow me on twitter and and people that like the podcast that i am lucky enough to be a part of and i have had such an amazing time so let me just 
put this out there now on the podcast on this show as part of the like plug block where I just talk about all the things that has come have come out this week and we'll make this part of that. I'm going to let you guys know where I'm coming because I would like to run into you. I would like to high five. I would like to say hello to you because I've really enjoyed meeting all of you people all around the world. It's, it's, it's a gerbs tour. Um, and, uh, gerbs is coming to a town near you. So this week I'm going to be in Columbus, Ohio. If you're in or near Columbus, Ohio, I will, uh, I will be there. So follow me on Twitter. I believe I will be free Tuesday night. Um, And then I have a game Wednesday. So, uh, and then I believe I fly back Thursday morning. So, um, yeah, check it out. I'll be there in Columbus. Oh, my God. Slutty Ira Sockman. Slutty Ira Sockman. There we go. <laughs> um, Merkin McGee says, what if somebody slutty cla- cosplayed as Jerry? Uh, it would be the best thing ever. It would be the greatest thing that's ever happened. Um, slutty Dick DiBartolo. Okay. Um, plugs. Let me talk about plugs. What did I do this week? Uh, Weird Things Podcast was hilarious. Uh, Goatman Rises, available on weirdthings.com. We talk about uh, the Goatman of Utah, which has since been solved. We talk about um, finding life on Mars. Uh, it just—it was a really great episode. I did it from a hotel room in Skidaddle. Oh, by the way, huge shout out to Adam Smith. Adam Smith uh, and Cheesy G, whose first name completely ev- has evaporated from my mind. Um... You know, uh, they were great. I ran them in Seattle. Uh, Cheesy G helped me out, uh, you know, walking around the uh, Pike Place. She was a great tour guide. Adam Smith was actually in the game. He was one of our plants, one of our actors. And, uh, yeah, he he was great. He played a, a crazy Seattle Sounders fan. He also gave me a ride to the hotel. He was solid, awesome dude. So big cheers to those guys. All right. Weird Things Podcast. NSFW Show Podcast. Just a great, amazing episode. Uh, we had Get Set Go live in the studio. Um, you know, I thought the sound mix was maybe a little bit, a little, little janky. I know people were complaining about it. And the final thing, I mean, like, you know, listen, we can we can strive to get better with stuff like that. But ultimately, it's like, you know, we had to set up an entire kind of live recording studio in about 35 minutes. And there's only so much that we can do. You know, uh, we did the best that we could. We had Jammer be on the board. Um, so yeah, it was pretty cool. I loved it. Uh, I love being there. And this week, whoo, whoo, big, big news, big news. Number one, moving to Monday or on Monday and not Tuesday. Number two, live in studio, BB, Brad Bizzle, Brushwood up in this bitch. Um, so check that out. Check that out no 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 no, not permanently moving we're just just for today and also also bill meeks is going to be there also we released the diamond club book oh oh it begins it begins um yeah the time should be the same 10 o'clock eastern time seven o'clock pacific time I don't know what that is. It would be three in the morning, uh, London time in the Olympics. Uh, Dark Ober. What happened to Night Attack 2? Night Attack 2 remained 70% finished. I listened to uh, I listened to the rough cut again, and it's very, very funny. But again, the, the problem remains that it's just like literally every funny track is about dicks and coming and jerking off. And like we can do a track, uh, an album where a lot of it is about that. We can't do an album where everything is about that. Um, so we will, there's, there's already, we have a couple ideas on stuff that we're going to record on top of that. Um, we just need to get around to doing them. Maybe I'll tell Brian to bring his mics. 
if he brings a mic, then maybe we can just record like here because he's coming here tomorrow. So, okay. Um, so NSFW was great. Big NSFW this week. Uh, I got a great. Um, I got a very good interview with uh, Howley Magic. If you're into magic, they were on uh, America's Got Talent. A very cool story. Um, you know, you, you just kind of like the the sort of making something of yourself uh story oh when will weird things be this week man i'll tell you what i think we'll probably just do it before so we'll do it at um maybe 6 p.m maybe me and bry from like behind the scenes at twit with andrew maybe we'll do it do it double style um yeah we'll see to be honest with you i, I hadn't thought of it um, so I'll have to figure it out. Uh, I don't know if it'll be, I don't think it'll be on, on, on the Twit live stream. They've, they've kind of stopped doing stuff like that. So I, I wouldn't think so. Although we might just be behind, you know, behind the curtain at Twit. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's talk about, I want to, I, yeah, I got to get the drop now that I got the, uh, the, what's it called? The uh, History of the World Part 1. I just need uh, I need the, the job. Politics, 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 politics. Let's talk about politics. Um, oh, here. We do have a theme song for politics. Let's go ahead and play the theme song. What? 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 Hold on. Wait a minute. Boogly. Gal is like a racehorse. I play her to win. But if I should lose her, another may come in. All right. Well, we continue with the uh, sloppy left-handed hand job. That is the middle of the summer of this political campaign. Um, to be honest, I really wish I could talk about, like, really great campaigning. I really wish I could. I, I really, really, really wish that I could talk about the good things that either campaign is doing. But unfortunately, I think both campaign is just, they're just both, like, fucking so weird. I think that they're both just, like, very scared. They're very, very scared campaigns, and I don't think either are really particularly smart. You know, uh, I think that both are are really dumb, to be honest with you. Like, you know, Romney, uh, you know, he goes out to the Olympics, and I think you know, he comes off as a dick at, at the Olympics. And it, if there's one thing that I think you know, the dude probably knows uh, quite a bit about is running Olympics. So it's like, it's not like in my mind, I think he's coming off a dick for no reason. Like he, if he says that the Olympics are fucking poorly put together, then like, you know, it's not like he's talking about shit. He didn't know about Like he knows about it. He helped fucking save the Olympics in, in Salt Lake city. And you know, he's got a, a track record on that, but it's still bad to come off like a dick. It's stupid. And meanwhile, on the other end, fucking uh, the Obama, campaign is just completely I, I you know when John Kerry had the swift boat thing the problem was not that uh the problem was not and so uh Joe Calhoun says Mitt Romney equals John Kerry 2.0 and that's very interesting because I would say right now Obama is making a very very John Kerry mistake he's making the same mistake that John Kerry did when when Bush and or people who were for the election, the re-election of President Bush in 2004, uh, attacked John Kerry on the swift boat thing, therefore undermining uh, his military service, the mistake that Mitt Romney made was legitimizing it by talking about it. It was a ridiculous claim. It was the kind of claim that you were going to see in, in campaigns. It, it happens. This is what happens. But... He decided to make it an issue by saying, well, these are lies. We need to correct people on these lies. So he brought in all of his friends, and he came in in the fucking duck boat, uh, you know, with, with in fucking the uniform with his friends, and, like, 
was just stupid. It made him look dumb. And right now, uh, Obama's doing similar things, not to the point that John Kerry did, but he's doing the same things with the you didn't build that thing. You didn't build that thing. They are treating like it's a conversation that they need to correct. It's not a conversation they need to correct. They need to talk about their own conversation. If you are talking about the opposing campaign's messaging, you are losing. It's a bad thing to do. It is the hallmark of a poorly run and poorly organized campaign, in my humble opinion. I don't think that winning campaigns do that outside of the first 24 hours. Something happens, you respond to it, you move on. Because there are more important conversations you want to have. Now, compare that to all the money they've poured in to these Bane attacks. Your punishment must be more severe, Mitt. I don't approve of your record at Bane Capital. When your campaign is in ashes, you have my permission to die. Mitt Romney. Um, when he, he, he put a ton of money into these Bain Capital attacks, and then by the polls, people trust Mitt Romney more on the economy afterward, as opposed to less on the economy afterward, than you have spent a lot of useless money. That is an NI, negative impact. How much money do we want to put into the Bain attacks? Do you feel in control? Um, so, I mean, again, I think both campaigns are, are just, you know, they're, they're, in, they're in just kind of a stall mode. You know, I don't think either of them are really doing anything particularly smart. I really don't. Um, you know, I, I, wish, I, wish, I wish they were. I wish that we had some really cool things to talk about. Right now, we don't. I know it's uh, it's really going to be um, way up and says if you follow the other campaign's agenda, you enter a bait that you can't win because the premises are set up against you. Yes, 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 yes. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. That is what I'm saying. You can't start if they want to debate whether or not you didn't build that is real. You've lost. You've lost already. You've, you've, you're entering in on an unfair premise. And also, listen, the you didn't build that thing is the same fucking kind of thing that when, the, the, and they pointed out when Romney had the, like, I don't care about, you know, I, I don't care about uh, very poor people. Now, people leapt on that, or the I enjoy firing people. Like, they leapt on that because that latches on to a preconceived definition of Mitt Romney that he's a cool, unhuman rich person that he's separated and he is unlovable therefore it highlights that obama is very very likable he's a likable dude conversely the you didn't build that thing latches on to the preconceived notion for obama that he is a meddlesome government socialist so that's uh you know, that's what, uh, you know, that that's why it's sticking. If you, th if Romney had come out and said, and run ads saying, Mitt Romney really does love very poor people. And then they just had pictures of Mitt Romney putting fucking money in like homeless people's cups. Then that would be stupid. No, I'm not saying the socialism thing. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm saying that that's what, that's what the, is, is. Obama's opponents will paint him as, and, and do paint him as. Robert Badger, this will all be forgotten in two months. The campaign are all about getting their bases. Now, the general, pop, general populace won't pay attention till after the Olympics, if even then. Here's my point, Robert Badger. It, it would have been gone a week ago if the Obama campaign had stopped fucking talking about it. But they're talking about it. They're spending money on it. They're buying campaign ads to debate fucking you didn't build that. That's retarded. And if you are a follower of President Obama's re-election campaign, and you look at the polls right now, and you see how fucking tight they are, 
This is not the time to be fucking around, wasting money, especially when you're going to have a, a disadvantage money-wise, which, by the way, is another failure, because they said they were going to be a billion-dollar campaign, and they're not. You know, they're, they're going to get outspent because of the PACs, and that's, that is a failure. That is you not having your ducks in, the ducks in a row. You not having fucking people who are energized and ready to fucking shell out a ton of money. That is a failure on the, on the Democratic side, you know. That's just how politics works. Obama raises a shit ton of money in 08. He probably won't raise as much money in 2012. That's not good. All right. That about wraps it up for politics. Is there anything else that I wanted to talk about? Let me uh, look at my prep sheet. By the way, my prep sheet is uh, looking at what I wrote on Twitter. Movies. Um... Okay, no, uh, Rabbit Badger. Yeah, all right. One last thing about politics. Actually, that's more like Clinton's successful immediate response stuff. Kerry's issue was that he waited too long to fight back. No. Clinton's success came from the fact that he had a coherent narrative that he could talk about instead of talking about things that were critical against him. Your point is not to respond. Your point is not to win your opponent's arguments. Your point is to have your own conversation that you're having so when people, other people yell things at you, you can continue to say they're distracting from what we are talking about. We are right now having a dialogue with the country about this, 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 and that's why they suck at, at this. So Clinton had, we balanced the budget. With, this is a time of, of peace uh, an economic boom. Uh, and so within 24 hours, talk about it. But you talk about it in a way that says, this is a distraction. We're not worried about it. It's dumb. It's wrong for this reason, this reason, this reason. And they'll say anything so we can stop talking about this. And then keep talking about this. Clinton was great at that. Reagan was great at that. Bush and Karl Rove were great at that. People that are great at being elected president are great at that. Obama was very good at it in, in 08. He had a very, you know, he had he had a, a, a very big narrative, you know? And, and anytime anybody tried to throw anything at him, it was, you know, deflected by his narrative. He doesn't have a narrative this year. He doesn't. If he does, someone can fucking explain it to me. But it, it's not coherent, I think, to an average voter. And to be honest... Beyond throw the bum out, I don't know if Mitt Romney has it either, you know, except for uh, I'm a really rich guy and I could run the economy better than Obama. But to me, I think that says more about Obama than it says about Mitt Romney. So that's what uh, Chimera 96, nationals tight, state by states are not as close, not including those stone cold locks. Listen, it's going to come down to Florida, Virginia and Ohio. Um and those are all in play. None of those are being won by either. And the 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 campaign that wins two out of those three are going to win the election. Uh, you know, and if anybody thinks that this thing's over, then they're wrong. It's not over. This is going to go down to the wire. No matter how fucking shitty these campaigns are right now, this is going to go down to the fucking wire. Because either, you know, Mitt Romney's going to catch momentum or Obama's going to self-destruct. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. All right. Uh, movies, real quick. Let's all go ahead and take a look at the movie draft. Um, there is, you know, obviously what happened uh, last week with the shootings in Aurora, the Olympics, uh, things are extraordinarily soft at the box office. Like tissue paper soft. It's not a good time for Sarah. Uh, it looks like Sarah's done. He is, or, or, you know, the, the, the Batman, the Batman, uh, is just not, uh, you know, took a 75% dive. Maybe it'll go up again next week, you know, uh, but is it going to be the $700 million movie that Sarah needs it to be? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I think that that ship has sailed, which means that now... We have basically a two-horse race, and Tom has to hope that Total Recall 
and Paranorman can make up about a hundred and eighty million dollars, which is what my lead on him on him is right now while I still collect ancillary returns from Brave Spider Man, uh Ice Age four and Ted. Um so we will see. But I will say this, jury fans. It looks like this is a uh, promising news. When your movie draft is in ashes, you have my permission to pay me a hundred and twenty dollars. Tom Merritt. Your punishment must be more severe. Uh, yeah, so there we go. It looks good. It looks good. Not a good weekend for the movies this week. Hopefully a very crappy weekend uh, next week. Total Recall tanks. Paranorman makes okay money. I continue to rake in just, you know, that $20 million a week, $30 million a week, something like that. I'm not saying... That I've won. I'm saying that this is easily the closest I've been to winning. And uh, if call me DJM says don't spike the ball yet, Jerry, and I won't until Total Recall tanks. Total Recall tanks. I'm going to just go ahead and Google Dion Sanders touchdown dance, and that's what I'm going to do. And I may do it live I, I may i may drive up and be there during frame rate and i might do the Dion sanders touchdown dance that is what's going to happen if total recall tanks if total recall tanks and fair norman looks like crap i'm going to do the Dion sanders touchdown dance and then spike the 120 dollars <laughs> what am i going to do with all those dollars i'm going to uh number one have to buy brian a steak because i fucked up and made a side bet and bet brian a steak and so i gotta buy him a steak um and number two i don't know i don't know i'm gonna convert it all to quarters and throw it at people um all right i believe that wraps it up for this edition of jury friday i very much uh enjoy these chats of ours uh let's go ahead and take a look at our straw poll are fake geek girls insulting or not? Not. Wins. 66% to 34%. Boom. Um, that Dave Nelson. When am I going to make this a podcast? Well, you know, I've always kind of thought that uh, this needed something to be a podcast. Like it needed a little bit something else. Like it needed like an interview or something like that. But I don't know. Maybe people just like this. Maybe, you know... I mean, the teal deer, um, I mean, I don't know. I like that Reddit. I'm on that Reddit. Go check out the teal deer Reddit, reddit.com slash r slash teal deer, T-E-L-D-E-E-R. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll just do it as a podcast, you know, a teal deer dot reddit dot com. I'm on it. Go ahead out there. Check it out. That's where I like to find uh, stories to talk about. Um, I guess I, I, I just... Uh, Funkarious. You should find a feisty young co-host. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I can handle... Like This is, this is a far too narcissistic venture for me to bring anybody else in. Um, yes! Let's make a song list... For the podcast, so you can, uh, so so you guys can can suggest songs. That'll be awesome. Um, Coleman DJM says my platonic friend Ashley Paramore would always be welcome. Yeah, yeah, she would. Uh, yes. All right. Well, that about wraps it up for Jury Saturday. Oh yeah. By the way, let's do another. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you it. I'll put a straw poll on the subreddit on the teal deer subreddit and uh 
you guys can vote on whether or not you want this on Fridays or Saturdays. Because Fridays have tended to be a little bit busy lately. Saturdays have not. Uh, it seems like we're getting more people on uh, on Saturdays. So, uh, But I will leave it up to you guys. I mean, ultimately, it's my schedule, so I have to choose when we're doing it. But, like, last week, you know, I had a client call early. I had a, the interview with the AGT people. And then I had to go do other stuff. I also had to write the blog. So it's like... Um, you know, we will we will see. But I'll put the vote up to you guys because uh, your opinion does matter a lot. So that about wraps it up for the final time. My name is Justin Robert Young. This is Jury Saturday. And please remember, folks, don't die before the next time we do a show. <laughs> Hold on. This just in. Dave Leventhal from Politico. Uh, and what did I say before? What did I say before? I said that it is a failure by the Democrats because they've not been able to raise money. That is a that is a, a, a black and white statement. That's not a political statement. That is a failed goal. Dave Leventhal, who writes a fantastic uh, money column for, for Politico. He, all he does is just track dollars and cents. Where's money going? More Debbie Downer Democrat money uh, raising emails. Quote, this is an email going to Democratic uh, fundraisers. We can't panic. Paving the road for a Romney administration. If we wait, it will be too late. Just saying, if you think that I'm just making this shit up, I'm not making this shit up. This is a, this is a real problem for the Democrats. Oh, one more piece of breaking news. Andrew Maine's Angel Killer uh, was up to 192 in all Kindle books uh, yesterday. Do me a favor. If you bought the book, go ahead and write a review for it. That always helps in terms of uh, showing people that it's uh, it's super legit. And number two, if you haven't bought it, buy Angel Killer, man. It's like three bucks. It's super awesome. And it's a fucking great book. I love it. Anyhow. (laughs) 